Guys, welcome to the newest episode of Quick Out the Blocks. I am your host, Sheena Quick. I'm joined by sports marketing guru, Polo <laughs> Kerber. How you doing, fam? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. And it seems like it was just yesterday that we were in Miami, like, having a complete blast. Now we don't even yeah. know when we'll really, really have sports back. How for sure. In- how insane has that been for you, you know, in your particular profession? Um, it's definitely been a lot, uh, you know, just because I feel like Miami, it was February, it was kind of the kickoff of the year. And I was planning all the events that I was going to be doing, you know, leading up into uh, the All-Star Weekend, you know, the NBA playoffs, the big three, and then the restart of the football season. I felt like there was so much traction um, and everything was going good. And then I remember I was, I think Nate and myself actually were at the Lakers and Nets game. Wow. Um, and we stayed for the whole game. He wanted to leave early because uh, he didn't want to have to like meet everybody after the game and stuff. And then Anti-social. that was the, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just hard. Cause you, you know, you're at a basketball game. He's going to literally have to like shake hands with everybody. And that's right. kind of like when the Corona had like, we were actually like teasing about it. Like he's like, I don't want to shake all these people here. They might give me the corona. <laughs> and we were kind of like joking about it at the at the time. Right. Um, and then that was that was the last basketball game. And um, you know, it's kind of just been been paused since then. So it's it's been um not challenging, but um we definitely had to, you know, figure out creative ways to, you know, keep working and, and keep the flow going for sure. So why don't you tell everyone, give them a little background. Of course, I know what it is that you do, but for the listeners yeah. or viewers that might not know, just tell them who you are. You got some skin in the game. I appreciate it. Um, so my name is Polo. Uh, real name's Napoleon. I go by Polo. Um, I have a sports marketing company. Um, I mainly work with NBA players and NFL players, um, just helping them to get endorsement deals, you know, if they wanted a a Coca-Cola commercial or a Nike contract, pretty much secure stuff like that for them, um, as well as doing different marketing opportunities, appearances, setting up charity events for them. Uh, uh, the event side is a little bit tough right now um, because I, I, literally, I literally can't. But, um, you know, lately it's just been helping them on their digital side, building up their social medias, um, engaging with fans that way. Uh, we've been doing a lot of stuff like different like Instagram lives or, you know, live video platforms, just ways to, you know, stay connected with the fans. And um, lately we've been doing a lot of Twitch. Um, definitely been getting oh, a lot of, yeah, getting a lot of the players into gaming because they're just sitting at home anyway. You know, you just train all day and then what are you going to do for the rest of the day? So you just play video games. And, you know, that's been interesting ways to kind of do a little bit of like, you know, cross stuff where we could take, you know, a football player and a basketball player and have them play each other in like Madden and 2K, you know, and cool. stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. So who are some of your, um, I know you have tons of clients. Who are some of your clients like past and present? Um, I work with, so the first client I ever started with, I guess that you could say got me into what I'm doing now was LaShawn McCoy. Um, oh. And he kind of, yeah, he kind of gave me, um, you know, just an opportunity to, I was just a kid working at a sneaker store at the time. Um, and he actually let me put together or put a couple autographs on this together um, at my store that I had. And we did two um, and they went really well. And it continued from there. He started to introduce me to other people. Um, and, you know, it just built up slowly over time. So this was about uh, six years ago now. Oh, wow. um, yes, yeah, so currently I work with, um, Nate Robinson, Carlos Boozer, um, Corey Clement from the Eagles, Tyrell Williams from the Raiders, <clears throat> um, Adoree Jackson from the Tennessee Titans. Um, we got your guy uh, Eli Apple on the uh, on the nice. Panthers now, but um, you know this is starting to build up. Um, Nate's been helping out a ton um, to kind of bring in some of some of the guys that he knows. We just started working with Mario Chalmers and Will Bynum, um, and that that kind of got set up through Nate. Um, but you know, it just continues to, continues to grow and continues to build. When I first started, I was working with uh, another marketing company and now I have my own. So, um, you know, it's it's definitely been a good progression, but, um, you know, still trying to figure it out as I, as I go, because it's not like this was something I 
you know, went to school for, That's or, not you. Like, yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> you didn't know that this is what you wanted to do, or it was kind of, no. like, I'm gonna set up these autograph signings, and then it just, like, the passion just took over? I didn't even know it was a job, like, something that you could be like, <laughs> you know what, like, yeah, I want to, I want to work for these players, and, like, yeah. get them Nike deals, because I didn't know anything about it, so I just always assumed that that was something that an agent did, um, and I didn't know that there was somebody that was really there for these guys, like day to day to day. I would assume it was an agent, you know, when I, when I didn't know about it. Um, so I can't say it was a dream because I didn't, you didn't even know um, that that position even existed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, but now, you know, at the position that I'm in, um, you know, I love it and I have, I have no regrets about it. There's no, um, you know, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. Um, you know, I was just like a, a, a sneaker store employee. So um, to be doing this and, and, you know, have the career that I have is I'm grateful. But I also feel like it, it helps me to, to push harder and work harder, too, um, you know, just because that is where I come from. So to, you know, be in a position that I, I almost felt like I had to, like, earn my place or, you know, show people that I do belong. Um, I get it. You know, it, 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 it kept me uh, kept me moving. That's pretty awesome, man. I never Thank knew you. that, like this was just a one, I mean, you just, you're so good at what you do. I just imagine that that was always your goal. Like it's yeah. hard guys, if y'all have ever seen him at these events, I mean, he is putting in work and he's so good at it. He's so well versed at it that you would never imagine that, you know, it kind of fell into your lap. It was something that you, didn't do the that you wanted to do. So yeah. I thank you for that. Now, thank you. with that being said, now that you're six years in the game, if you had to say that there was one dream client that you don't have already, who would that be? Mm -hmm um probably lebron just because you know just um like growing up i, I think i was watching him maybe since yeah. like seventh seventh or eighth grade you know um like 2002 2003 um yeah. even before that actually you know when he was like in high school so like 01 02 um i i think that that would probably be a dream client just to have it and be able to, because if you do work with a LeBron, then you could work with anybody else anybody, too. Anybody, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's not necessarily like, I want to work with LeBron because I want to work with LeBron. And he has a great team around him. So honestly, right. I don't know what I would even be able to bring to the table that they can't already bring to the table because they are so well-versed. But that's, I guess I would say his team is who I try to, um, you know, base what I do around. Like, look, at, I look at what Rich Paul does, what Maverick Carter does, and I kind of, um, you know, build my philosophy and what I want for some of my guys around that. They are so big now that, um, you know, it's it's kind of like, I like to be a little bit more like one-on-one -on -one with my clients. I know that with them, you know, when you have a LeBron James and you have an Anthony Davis, it might be hard to, you know, maybe give a lower guy on the totem pole the same attention. So I think that that's, that's really where I try to differ myself is if it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the biggest guy on the, on the roster or the lowest guy on the roster, I try to give, you know, everybody the same amount of attention and um, give everybody the, the same amount of work. But I, I definitely think, um, you know, that would be, it'd be crazy to, to work with them or, um, you know, do something. That would be, it would be cool. Even if it was an event, you know, just like one event and we kind of did like a collaboration or something, it'd be cool. Now you have guys everywhere. I know you specified, you know, that you kind of zone in or, or, you know, make, I'm sorry, your roster has more mm -hmm. NBA and NFL players on it. Yeah. So with those players preparing to go to the Disney bubble, what, yes. what effect does that have on you, if any, like what is, is like logistically, you know, the big three was canceled, but a lot of those guys are playing in the tournament. Some of those, exactly. some of those guys are playing in the five tournament in Vegas. Like you have yep. people all over the place whereas it might have been a little bit easier to maneuver between clients but now it's like if you're in the bubble you can't go out so how exactly. is, have you figured out any type of strategy kind of as sports slowly starts to creep back in it's definitely a learning curve because um we just started getting into soccer too so we have like some soccer guys wow. in the bubble so the the problem not the problem i would say but the difficulty the, or the challenge yeah the, the challenge is that you know you have so many things that are kind of popping up where you know that there's this nba bubble you don't know a hundred percent if it's even going to happen and then if it does happen you don't i don't know if larry sanders is going to get a call to you know join a team like who's who's going to back out of the bubble or who might catch coronavirus or who's going to say i don't want to play because social injustice is or, you know, and then yeah. it could be a point guard. So then that might have nothing to do with it. So it's really just like almost 
like sitting waiting. there waiting. Yeah. I'm literally just waiting um, compared to when there's a regular season. I can maneuver where I can say, okay, cool. I know the Raiders play the Bills week four in Vegas. So, you know, I can set up some events here with Ty and, you, you know, focus know on that. I, I don't know. And, I, and then I don't know, you know, what's open, what's going to be open in the future. Um, so it's even hard to plan things now for once this is over because I don't know, you know, when things are going to be over. So it's a little bit, um, you know, difficult just trying to like really maneuver that. And then the schedules are changing so much. So even in like, you know, the last week, Nate was going to play in the TBT tournament and then he couldn't get his coronavirus testing in time. So then that pulled back. And then now he's in the five tournament um, in Las Vegas, which, you know, is cool. But then that switches where, you know, we're going to be in Ohio for this amount of time. So now we're going to be in Vegas for like a 10 day period. And then, you know, he's, he's at the process of like trying to come back too. So I don't know if he's going to come back, if an NBA team will want him. Um, if not, we're, we're going to look at doing some overseas stuff. Um, but Nate's the one that I work with. Yeah, he's in, he's in really good shape. And he, you know, he's, he wants to, to prove that he can still play. Um, so, you know, then that goes into, that's probably the guy I work with the most like hand in hand, like day to day. Right, and right. then that means that my main client would be in Australia while still trying to, you know, work with everybody else. Then it breaks down into different time zones. Um, you know, we're working with like different companies. So we have a company we work with in Hong Kong, one in Australia, one in Paris. And then here, well, I'm in uh, Los Angeles now and then New York. So you have a three hour time difference just in, yeah. Uh, in America, you know, and then, and then you go, you know, now you're looking at 12 hour difference, 10 hour difference, 13, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's like an all day kind of thing, you know, where I can wake up to, um, you know, here at a normal time, I can wake up at, you know, eight o'clock, and it's already 11 o'clock in New York. And then so everybody's working already, they've been working for two hours. And then you have people in Hong Kong who are trying to reach you before they go to bed, or, you know, people in Australia who are getting ready to wake up in a few hours from now. So um, it's definitely a, a, a challenge just to try to, you know, maneuver all that and figure everything out. Honestly, you're the first person that came to mind when like all of these, I'm like, how is he going to do this? I have got to ask him yeah. <laughs> because, you know, NFL, they just cut the preseason down to two weeks. Exactly. Um, you have different players in different states going back to work at different times. You know, the Panthers are hoping to have training camp in what I think it's like maybe 23, 22 days at this point. No one right. knows if it's going to happen. And so you have these one, you might have this camp start and then this camp in this city can't start because X amount of tests came back positive. Exactly. Like, so that's, you were the first person that came to mind when I was thinking about it. I'm like, how is he going to do all this? Because I'm trying to figure out yeah. how I'm going to do it. For I'm sure. Supposed, I'm supposed to be in Vegas also for the five tournament, but I'm like, do I want to go to Vegas? Let me look yeah. at what their cases are. Where am I going to be staying? Like, am I going to be safe because I have to come back home to children? It's so exactly. many different factors. And yep. that being said, and this, you now having your own agency, I know that you could pro probably definitely use the help, but you are dealing with high profile clients and sensitive yep. information. How difficult is it to expand your team because you're going to need to expand obviously because of situations exactly. like this with the logistics yep. and your workload so talk to us about having your own brand and being so protective of that brand because you know how hard you worked to start it to build it and to build the reputation what type of challenge does that pose when you're trying to expand it um right now it's definitely hard because when you're getting into expanding we are more than likely going to be working with somebody that has little to no experience because they're trying to get into that. So then right. if it's a challenge for me to figure out how am I supposed to teach you, it's almost like a relationship where it's like, how can I love you if I don't love myself kind of situation, yeah. you know, where it's like, how, how am I supposed to, um, you know, teach you how to do these things when I'm still learning how to do these things. It's not when it's regular where I can say, okay, boom, boom, boom. This or, is what you need to do. Or even can, shadow me and, and see how I do this because it's, exa there's exactly. so many, you know, hurdles. There's, there's, like there's so many hurdles and variables that it's it's almost like, you know, maybe if you did shadow me right now, you might think it's an unprofessional situation or think that it's not something that you want to do, but it's just because, you know, the way that it is right now, Right. Um, it, it makes it a little bit difficult. I do have, so the way that the company is broken down is I focus mainly on 
um, athletes. And then we have uh, my business partner does uh, social media influencers. And then my other business partner does musicians. So I do have a little bit help there in, you know, okay, musicians can't go on tour right now. So, right. you know, he, he might have a little bit more time where he can say, all right, cool. They're not doing anything. I can kind of come over and like help you a little bit. So yeah. um, we do have that. And, and I, I do have um, a great intern grant that, that worked with me. Um, and he was around before all of the, the craziness kind of happened. Um, so he's, he's been good in, in, in helping me. And, and like I said, you know, my business partners, you know, we've kind of just been able to, um, I guess, shift the gears of, of where our focus is will normally be at. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's, you know, definitely something that's hard. Like I can't expand right now for sure. Right, right. Um, and then trying to, I, I guess, maneuver and, and figure out what I'm maneuvering. That's um, <laughs> it's definitely difficult. So before all of this happened, did you have a five-year plan? Like, how do you go about setting go personal goals as well as like professional goals for the whole agency? For sure. So I would say that personal and professional just um, with myself. And actually, I, I don't want to... I don't want to say Corona was, it's all bad because it has helped me a lot. It makes to you sit down a lot. <laughs> it made me, yeah, exactly. So I would say that the five-year plan before the Corona is almost different than what it is now because, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for going on six years now. It started with all football, you know, all football players. And now it's kind of more geared toward, I'll work with the football guys that I have, but I don't necessarily want to take on newer football guys if I can take on basketball players just because they have longer careers, their faces are are no more. That's um true. They're, they're, and they're 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 seen more. So the opportunities and, and things that I'm able to give to them, um, you know, is, is a lot greater. So um I think that that's kind of uh where my shift went a little bit. Right. The only thing though is that with basketball players because they are so big in football you won't see an agent marketing their player you know where right. you, you might see Tariq Hill might be signed to one agency <clears throat> but then he has a different marketing, marketing guy. a different agency yeah exactly um and that's usually how it is with with all football players and basketball you're not gonna because you can only make four percent on a contract you know right. um and that's like the max so let's say you're making like one to four so you're not gonna see an agent that has LeBron James and then doesn't market him he makes he's a billionaire off the court and he right. you would make 20 you'd make way more money with with LeBron off the court than you went on so why would you not market LeBron if, if you, you had him signed to you so it's a little bit more difficult um as an agency so what I've kind of been in the process of transitioning to is partnering myself with an agent so that when when it comes to you know getting newer basketball players that are coming into the draft ones that are you know, going through the college system, skipping college and going to the G League, then we can sign them to an agency and uh, and marketing as well. So I think that that's been, um, you know, a little bit more of a, of a change and a transition. Um, and just during this whole corona, that's really where I've always wanted to work with soccer players. It's just a language barrier, country barrier. Um, yeah, the it's corona, not big over here. It's not big over here at all, but soccer is the biggest sport in the world. And the players' platforms are gigantic. The most followed person on Instagram, Ronaldo, is a soccer player. So, um, you know, their platforms are huge where you can find a player in a country you've probably never heard of, on a team you've never heard of, right. at a position that you've never heard of. And he might have, you know, 10, 20 million followers. And you're like, well, who is this guy? So their platforms are gigantic. Um, and that's been something that I've wanted to get into for a while and being able to slow down. Um, during this whole pandemic has allowed me to be able to meet the people that I needed to in soccer mm-hmm. to get me into um, that market. So I would say my five-year plan has actually changed now because before it was going from football to basketball and just trying to expand basketball as big as I can. Mm-hmm. Now it, it, there's still that where I want to focus on basketball, but add, um, add soccer as well. Um, maybe even like Formula One racing just to you know get more into the global market as well. Um, you know, because even though those guys are bigger overseas, America is still the number one country for 
sports marketing. So a right. lot of those guys will sign, you know, they'll sign with you just because you say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sports marketing rep from America. And, um, you know, they don't really have a lot of representation over there as far as like individual players. So let me ask you this. Um, when it comes to transition, one that we're seeing, we flirted with a little bit, well, actually a lot is top prospects actually considering HBCUs over PWIs mm -hmm. or Power 5 schools. Um, yep. Where do you see that going? Like, for I don't know a lot when it comes to the marketing side, so I'm not, what I'm looking at when I'm hearing this is like, okay, I think it's a great initiative, but how are the HBCUs going to challenge the Dukes, the Kentuckys, you know, for these sure. perennial powerhouses where, you know, they have all these different offers and all these things to lure you. You, from a marketing standpoint, if some, if you have the talent, you have the talent. Does it make a difference coming into the NBA or into professional basketball, whether it's overseas or not, does it make a difference if a player comes from an HBCU versus a Power 5 school? Or I, don't think, I don't think in 2020 it will make a difference or, to, or going forward. I don't, I don't think it will. When you have a player like Mikey Williams, for example, who said he would play at an HBCU, he's a freshman in high school and has 2 million followers on his Instagram platform, more than that on his Instagram platform. So right. as he continues, he, he has three more years in high school. So, you know, by the time he graduates high school, he might have six, seven million people that are watching him. I think he's doing more for that school. He's putting that school on that platform. It didn't matter if Zion went to Duke or if he went to, South you know, uh, <laughs> South Carolina State. He could have went to Grambling. He could have went anywhere. He was going um, <clears throat> because it's Zion Williamson. So I think for him, it was just more of like showing people I can compete at a competitive level. But his name was going to be big regardless. Lamelo Ball plays in Australia still probably going to be the, the the number two pick and he's still huge granted his dad does do a lot for him right. um so really it really just depends on what you're able to do you know on the platform that you're given especially when you're at the position where you know you might be going into college and you can make money off your likeness and do other things like that you know there's plenty of companies like in overtime or a ball is life or a slam magazine that might just give you a contract as far as, you know, kind of like pushing your name up that way to build you up, you know, and you don't really need to be at that big school. Um, I, I think it's just the big schools now might turn into more of, um, you know, I want to go to Duke because I grew up watching Duke or I want to go to North Carolina because I, I grew up watching North Carolina um, or, you know, you just want the high competition. But as far as um, you know, the marketing and, and the name behind it, you know, nobody, look how big John Morant is, you know, and nobody knew him before the, the NCAA mm -hmm. tournament. So I, I don't think that, yeah, I think now social media is so big, um, just media period, whether, you know, seeing seeing highlights on the TV and sports center, you know, top 10 clips or going on Instagram and seeing someone house of highlights or, you know, seeing something on, um, on, on overtime or anything like that, you know, I, I think, or, or quick out the blocks, you know, I, I think that to, to do stuff like that, um, it doesn't matter what school you're at. Do you think that that'll pose a challenge, the NCAA ruling about, you know, possibly allowing the athletes to make money off of their likeness, does that impact your, your industry? Does it, do yeah, you think that, in a good way. Right, so you'll be able to yeah. actually rep college players and not yeah. face any type of fines because exactly. we help to get their name out there. Okay. That's, exactly. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it, it'll help in a good way because I don't think that they can sign with an agent still. So I kind of get like the heads up in there where, you know, I can help them to bring in money throughout like this certain period of time before an agent can even talk to them. Um, you know, because I'm, I'm just doing marketing stuff for them. But yeah. I, I also feel like it helps because, you're going to get to a position where you might have a school like like a Duke who has a big a big backing as far as boosters and you know everything like that so you might have somebody at Duke that's like yeah hey, you know come here on this car dealership you know we want to make you the face of the car dealership for a season you'll get a hundred thousand dollars you got to do two meters you know or something like that so even to be able to you know, work with some of those players, look through those contracts, kind of like help them, you know, pick what, what the best deal is and, and make sure that they're good. Um, you know, I think that, that that can only help. 
you know, and, and you kind of get a head start to be able to show a player, hey, this is what I can do before, you know, you're even allowed to, to sign them and you can actually show them something. Show them what it is. Yeah. Now it's like actually, a trial almost. You actually touched on something that was really interesting that I do agree with you on. Um, it's different to, as far as going the HBCU route for basketball as opposed to football. Mm-hmm. Do you think, what do you think has to happen in college football to make HBCUs more attractive? Like, like you said, Zion was going to be Zion no matter where he went. But yeah. when you're a football player, it's a little bit different. There's so many more people on the field. There's so many different intricate parts. Like if you're a running back and you have a trash offensive line, you might not have that great of numbers. Exactly. So do you think that that'll be just the differences in the sport period and the perception of those athletes and how those different systems have to operate? Do you think it's more, I guess, reasonable for basketball players to choose HBCUs over football players choosing HBCUs? Yeah, I think it's different because basketball is more of an individual sport. Yeah. And the players have a little bit more power over their name. I think basketball is the only sport probably in the world where fans are more loyal to the players than yeah. they are yeah. to the team. You know, where if I'm a LeBron fan, I was a Cavs fan, then a Heat fan, then a Cavs fan, then a Lakers fan. I'm not watching the Cavs game still, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and if I was a KD fan and I liked the Thunder, I left when KD left or when Russell left, you know, still right. watching Thunder games. I, and I think it's different where, and then you can t- you see that too on the national TV, where if LeBron leaves the Heat, they might have had 30 national TV games last year. Now the Cavs have 30 national TV games and the Heat have five. So even if I do want to stay a Heat fan, just naturally you're not, you, you can't even watch the game. So they're not on TV. So then you're going to start following somebody else. Now I'm forced to watch the Warriors or forced to watch whoever's hot at the moment. Right. So I, I think there's a little bit more individuality with basketball and I think that that goes all the way you know down to the college system where you know you can be a great basketball player because it's such an individual sport right. you can be the only player on that team um you know kind of take over and Oklahoma is not the uh it's not an HBCU but they were trash and uh <laughs> Trey Trey Young you know helped them to be good Ben Simmons on LSU they were trash but Ben Simmons made them good um you know so I, I think that it's a little bit more of an individual thing. Um, So I feel like with college football, it's going to have to be a lot of players that collectively, you know, go Go to school together. Exactly. And they say, Hey, you know, this is what we're going to do. Let's team up almost like, you know, like a LeBron heat kind of moment and say, you know, this is what we're going to do because, you know, you start to see football players try to individualize themselves and they're, they don't get the same response as, as a basketball player, like uh, KD can say, I'm not going to play and you, or unless you guys give me this money and KD is going to get that money. You can't do that. And in, in football, Le'Veon Bell had to retire for a year, you know, and yeah. nobody, and then, and then still take less money, you know, or yeah. AB's out the league. He looks crazy. You know, then it's like, have, then they have that CBA that doesn't do them any favors. It, at exactly. All. <laughs> exactly. So you, you start to see that where, you know, it's like, Oh, Antonio Brown, he's crazy. He, you know, he, he wants to leave Pittsburgh and he literally w- is written off as crazy. And yeah. he has, you know, they, he has, um, uh, what was the, what's the disease? I'm blanking the concussion disease. CTE. CTE. They say, <laughs> they say, yes, CTE, you know, just because he's trying to individualize himself and make himself bigger than what the team is because in football, you can't do that. If I'm a Steelers fan, I'm a Steelers fan. I don't care about Antonio Brown. We had we had Santonio Holmes after before you. Then when he goes, you just got to move on. Exactly. Before you, we had Santonio Holmes. We had Plexico Burris. We were still winning games. That's how and that's how fans look at it. And after you, we're still going to have Juju Smith and you know whoever else comes up. And I think that that's the difference in football is that fans they're they're going to be loyal to you if you're if you're good with their team. But once that's gone, no Steelers fan is going to say, okay, cool. Hey, B's leaving, Le'Veon's leaving, let's go watch the Jets and the Raiders. Nobody's saying that. Well, let me so tell you, it's, I know it's a very, very, very rare occurrence, but, you know, here in Carolina, we're dealing with the departure of Cam Newton. That's different because <laughs> I feel like in, Car- in Carolina, first, Carolina's not as crazy as a football town right. as Pittsburgh is, but I feel like Carolina also has a history of doing things like that 
They did that with Cam. They did that with Luke Keekley. Yeah. They did it with Thomas Davis and Steve Smith. And Greg so I've I, ex- <laughs> Greg exactly. So I feel like it's different yeah. with that just because if it had just if Cam Newton was the first person that they did it to, then it's like, all right, Cam, you know, you were hurt the last two years. Um, you know, you wanted to demand a trade, blah, blah, blah. Like we didn't want you anyway. But the fans can see a history of they did this, this, this. Cause I don't think fans were were that upset at what happened to steve smith at that time i feel like people might be more upset about it now looking back on it just yeah. because they realize the the pattern and yeah. that it's a continuous thing you know um and i don't think other teams have that have that same beef i guess that fans in carolina can have with their organization because most teams don't consistently do their legend players the way that that carolina has done it so i think it's just a little bit different in that and you know because it's not Charlotte's not the craziest football city in the world um I think it's a little bit different but I also think it's pretty interesting is from a standpoint that this is something I've noticed when it comes to black football players individuality is frowned upon from certain fans they feel like oh you know you're too you know you're you're boastful you're a a me first person you're selfish but those are the players that we actually see get these huge huge endorsement contracts because they are able to individualize themselves you know their sport is played with a helmet on correct you know you could be in in walmart next to you know a tight end or somebody else on the team and you have no idea who that is because you've only seen them with a number on their back and a helmet on so exactly. when it comes to your football clients, you have some big, big name football clients, but For sure. what is the difference in marketing a football player versus basketball since they do have that limited visibility when it comes to that, you know the public? And that, that's why I mentioned um, earlier just that I've been focusing more on on expanding the basketball roster. It's not to say, that, okay, cool, if you're... Exactly. If you're on my roster already, like I said, I'm going to pay just as much attention to the top guys, the bottom guys. So all my football guys that are on my team right now, they're good. I'm going to do everything that I can to get you as many deals that I can and put you in place to, you know, be successful. However, it is more difficult to do things with a football player, firstly, because their careers are shorter. The average NFL career is only three years. So, you know, if I'm doing something, let's say your rookie year, that's when you're going to get the most marketing deals. You're going to have a sophomore slump in marketing. And then, you know, if you have a good year towards the end of the year, you know, you go into that third year, you can get hurt in camp and get cut and then your career is over and then you're done, you know, but it's, yeah. it's harder. It's harder in, in football. Um, just because the reasons that you said you have helmets on, you might have a visor on. Oh, you, you, have, you, <laughs> you can't see anything. There's 22 players on the field at once. There's 53 players on the team. Um, so, you know, like you said, you can be in Walmart and you might not know who this person is. So it's a little bit harder to build the individual brand um, for a football player compared to a basketball player, unless it's a city like Philadelphia or, you know, Buffalo or Green Bay, like those cities that care so much about their football teams then, you know, you could be the worst player on the team. And th- those fans are just so passionate that they're going to, you know, like worship you almost. Right. Um, but just on a national scale and getting getting things with, you know, bigger corporate companies and stuff, it's a lot easier to do it with basketball right. players um, to get that company to be interested and to get that company to pay more money. Um, you know, just Nate hasn't played in the NBA since 2013, 14, and he's... Yeah. It's been that long, and he's maybe no, because well, he did. I would say on a consistent level, okay, because he, you know, he had like his, his teams and stuff like that in between. But maybe like we could, even if we pushed it up to 2015, you're still at five years. Yeah. But he can't go. He can't go anywhere without being recognized and you know Absolutely. being stopped. He he literally has to plan extra time in his day to go to the airport because he knows he's going to get stopped he sees by so many people. He's to take a picture. Yeah. Exactly. And then once one picture starts and it's just like a domino effect of like, oh, I don't even know this guy's going to just, you know, take a picture. But, you know, it, it happens so, so much and they're so recognizable. Um, you know, compared, compared to football, I can say, oh, okay, cool. Like, I, I think I know who that guy is. Maybe I don't. You know, how many players that played for the Panthers five years ago? If you saw, you might not even, and you're in the locker room every day. There might be players that are on the team that you might not know what they look like, and you Listen, see them every day. 
I kid you not, um, I met a guy at one of the all-star events back in Charlotte. And, you know, when his, his, I guess, representative was introducing me to him, he was like, oh, you know, he plays for Panthers. And I was like, I didn't know me. <laughs> but I looked and said, you know what? He's been on this team for like two years. But he, yeah. you know, in that locker room, you get people that are there for years that never talk to media because exactly. no one goes to their locker. So, I mean, like, like you said, it, it, it's a huge difference. I was just wondering, you know, if that trickle down to the collegiate level and just what your strategies are. I mean, everything sounds pretty much the way, I mean, it's pretty much kind of common sense at this point when it comes to the visibility and the household names that we see with the NBA versus the NFL, not to mention sure. their contracts. Their contracts are completely contracts different. Are totally different. NFL the is, pay, you know. And the payment, the payment cycle too. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like with basketball marketing is more of a luxury, like, okay, cool, I'll do it because I want to do it or, you know. Okay, football, cool. you have to do it if you, you want to make the money that you want to make. Yeah, because you you're, only, you're only getting paid September through December. If you, if you play for the Browns, if you play for the Browns, you're, you're making money September through December. You're not making the playoffs. So, you know, that's, that's really like three months. Because, oh, okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, in, in basketball, it's a little bit different because they're payment cycles where, yeah. you know, you're getting paid for so long. The basketball season goes from October until June. And, <laughs> you know, you might be in the Olympics for a couple of months or, you know, yeah. use those couple. You could literally play all year. And I think that, that that's the point where LeBron started to get tired out was he was playing – you know, the whole season that he was doing the Olympics and he might do some preseason or some overseas stuff, you never stop playing basketball. Football, yes. you know, if you play for a team that's not making the playoffs, you're playing September through December, you get a bonus check in March, and then, cool, we'll see you again in, in you know, June or June, July, July. <laughs> but, yeah. you're not, but you're not getting paid again until September. Yeah, I mean, so you're getting like paid, but very the minimal. checks are very, I mean, they're, they're exactly. like us regular people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's like a... It's like a normal person check. So, you know, to get that, that NFL money that, you know, everybody thinks that you're making, you have to wait until September. I hope you make the team. And, um, so to do marketing, it, it's more important, I would say, to those players, but it's also harder, um, you know, even to take a guy like, I mean, Tom Brady is probably, he's the best player of all time, so he's fine. But, you know, if you take somebody like Odell Beckham, who had all these opportunities when he played for the Giants, and he goes to Cleveland, he's still Odell Beckham, but he's not getting, you're not seeing The market him. is different. Like, it's completely different because yeah. he's in a smaller, a smaller city. Granted, it's still a football city. He is still Odell Beckham, but it's completely and different. It is Browns. It's the you Browns. Know, no shade, guys, but you know the Browns have <laughs> not, you know, been powerhouses. That's not their reputation yeah. out there. Exactly. So it, it's, it's a lot harder to kind of, you know, get those things done on a marketing level compared to a LeBron James, he went from Miami to Cleveland, still had the same opportunities. Then went from yeah. Cleveland to LA, had more opportunities, but it, it wasn't, you know, completely different. But he right. could go back to Cleveland again and get those same opportunities because how big he is individually um, on a basketball court. And, you know, football, I don't know if it could ever be like that, you know. Um, just because of what I was saying with like the loyalty of the fans and how they are to their team. Right. You know, there's, there's no giant, maybe a handful of Giants fans that might've started watching the Browns just to, you know, go around with old Bell Beckham. Right. Um, but then probably realize that the Browns were still going to Brown and then start watching Giants games again. You know? It's such a shame of thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> like Cleveland's going to Cleveland. Yeah. Yep. But, um, I've seen you in so many different walks of life. Of course, you know, I met you when, with, through Devin Funches when he had his, yep. um, his Christmas and his cooking um, events during yes. his last season here in Carolina. Then came across you again with Big Three, with Nate Robinson and everybody else. So mm -hmm. I have to ask, you've been around so many different personalities. What's your funniest, like, sports marketing story? Oh... Uh... You can change the names to protect the guilty if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just feel like I'm caught off guard. I wish I would have known that question going into this. Let me... Um, but see, that's why it's better because you have to just off the cuff. Off the cuff. I know, but like, 
I'm drawing a blank almost like I have no stories right now. I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, funniest story. I don't know. I'm just like in my mind, I'm only thinking about like crazy things that fans do. I'm trying to think of you know, more of like a funny story or a situation. It can be a fan, it can be a fan um, story. And and the only one I'm thinking of off the top of my head, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty more stories and like crazy moments. I might even remember one later in the conversation, but <laughs> I do remember um, Nate and I were walking in New York I think we were trying to get where it was it was last summer when the Popeye's biscuits were or the Popeye's, the Popeye's crispy chicken, chicken sandwiches sandwich. <laughs> and Nate Nate wanted a Popeye's crispy chicken sandwich like yeah. so we were going to all these different Popeye's to find this crispy chicken sandwich everybody was sold out so we're like walking the streets of New York looking for one and there's a dude who's down the street but across the street we're walking like towards each other so we're going to pass each other but across the street and he he knew it was Nate from across the street so and we saw him look right at us so he he keeps going but then when he gets to his intersection crosses the street runs back down the street to get in front of us then like ties his shoe or something like that looks around and turns around just to walk past us again and then He's like acting like he's on the phone and he's like, Nate, Nate Robinson. <laughs> and it was like, it was the funniest. He had that thing thing. rehearsed. He had it rehearsed. He was ready. Like he, he literally ran across the street, crossed, ran in front of us and then turned around and then acted like he like didn't know. Like it was by chance. Like almost. he can't like, believe like he's like it, upon you guys. Exactly. Like by <laughs> chance. So that was like, at fin and fans do like crazy stuff like that. Like, all the time or you know that that was just like something that I just got a kick out of it because I thought it was like funny because I've never seen anybody do that you know and like even when when we're like sitting down and like eating at a restaurant stuff people like come up to us all the time and I can't imagine ever being in a position where I could see somebody that I want to meet and I'm like you know what let me just like go walk up to this dude while he's eating and sit down at his booth and like ask to take a picture or something like I can't imagine me neither. doing that and then if I oh, if yeah. I did if I did I can't imagine getting the response I would expect it's almost like a don't meet your heroes kind of thing like cool like oh my gosh there's LeBron James let me go sit down and get jazzy Jeff off the table right I can't imagine I can't imagine that going in a good way for me I guess so and the thing about um, it is Nate Nate's really good about that stuff. I remember interviewing him last mm -hmm. summer. He was like, you know, I'm never going to turn down a picture because I was that kid. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it is with grownups, but he's like, you know, I was, I was that kid. Yeah, he, and he, he, take, he, in the picture. he does that with, with grownups too, but he's, yeah. he's really good about that. Um, have you ever had a don't meet your hero situation? Where, um, some, where, where an encounter wasn't quite what you had always imagined it to be. No, yes and no, yes and no. I feel like usually, especially the, the situation that I'm in now, I feel like usually when I, when I meet somebody, even if I just go up to them and talk to them, once I introduce myself, then it's more of, okay, Corey's not a fan, He's, you know, he wants to have a conversation, right, right. blah, blah, and then it's more of like a relief almost, like, okay, cool, this, this is this person yeah. who works with these people. Um, so I feel like it's been more okay there i was like my two heroes when i was growing up i played high school like i wore their numbers in high school um did like everything on the football field that i could based on to and ocho cinco so, like i've never <laughs> i've never met still to this day i've never met to him and Nate are like really close so like yeah. You know, we've had conversations. Jamal Crawford was my favorite basketball player growing up. I will argue with, I literally had an argument with Jamal Crawford that he was better than Michael Jordan. Like, I will argue. <laughs> he was like, no, I'm not. You're like, look, yes. yes. He's like, he was like, no, I'm not. I'm like, bro, Jamal Crawford, blah, blah, blah. It was almost like I was having an argument with somebody else. That's um, but yeah, I was literally having an argument with Jamal Crawford. And that's like, I loved Jamal Crawford. Just grow. him and LeBron were like my, I don't know why it was, Jam I, I think, uh, 
one of my friends called me one day. It was it was the game that he he scored um, 16 shots in a row. And one of my friends called me one day and he was like, bro, you got to turn MSG on. There's this dude on the Knicks number 11. He does not miss when he shoots. So I'm like, okay, cool. Like, uh, you know, I'll turn it on. And I just, Jamal Crawford was just making every single shot. <laughs> and just like as a little kid and like MSG was like the only channel I really could watch sports on. Right. Um, I just like, I would always watch the Knicks games every day. So like Nate and Jamal Crawford. So it's like really, even now, like surreal to me to, to kind of work with Nate. I remember the day Nate followed me on Instagram and I didn't know him at the time. I thought it was like one of those like fan pages or like it would say Nate Robinson to have like two ends or like, or the dot dot or something yeah, like, like a dot dot or something. And then it was like actually Nate Robinson. I was like, Oh, what's, what does he want? Like, what is he you know? So <laughs> I, I remember like, you know, being super excited about that, but going back to um, Ocho, like I met him at the Pro Bowl and it wasn't a bad experience, but it was kind of like, it was just like quicker than I thought it would be. Or like, he was like really just like short. I know he's he like always like, else. exactly. He's always been pulled in. A, <laughs> exactly. He's always been yeah. pulled, pulled in a million directions. And I know how that goes. So it wasn't um, like a don't meet your heroes. Like he was uh, like an asshole or anything like that. But um, you don't you just know, like to be able to chop it up a little bit more. Exactly. Because like kid, kid me, you know, was like, he he was he was the best, you know. No, nobody could tell me anything about Tio or Ocho Senko or Jamal Crawford, and that was, you know, that was uh, like my three go-to guys when I was when I was growing up. I would say, well, I've always I'm, I'm a huge Vince Carter fan. Never got to meet him, but I wore his yeah. number in high school, like in the yep. fifteen. For football, I would say it's always been Deion Sanders. You know, he went to Florida mm. State. I went to Florida State's prime time. Yep. He's, you know, he's confident i'm not gonna say cocky or arrogant he's confident he walks the walk he talks the talk so meeting him at the super bowl last year in atlanta it was just like that's the first time i think i've ever been starstruck yeah especially in my field i'm just like that's deon sanders yeah i can't can't show that i'm starstruck because i'm there as an idiot but i'm like exactly prime time (laughs) deon deon yeah i I totally Uh, get it i totally get it i feel like i get like that a lot of times, um, you know, where, where it is, you have to be cool, but yeah, you know, there is like a, a, like a little bit of just like, you know, geeking out and like, I listen to the Migos all the time. So I think like now I've, I've met Quavo a bunch of times, but I had never met any of the other ones and Offset is my favorite rapper in the Migos. So even like this last weekend, um, you know, just even like meeting and I didn't even know he was that I was going to meet him like that was kind of cool cool to me and I was like oh that's that's all set and I was like oh all right cool you know no I listened to some of his songs and you know so it was cool but then with him I actually like went up had a conversation um we exchanged numbers and we're gonna like set some some twitch stuff up and and some stuff like that so that was it was cool like it was uh like that's how I would imagine that every situation would go in my head. Um, and it, it was a, uh, it was a good situation. I meant to ask you earlier, I don't know how that even, how it even slipped my mind. Um, in addition to the coronavirus, mm-hmm. we've had this, this unrest, this civil unrest that has bubbled to the surface um, yeah. with the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Mar Aubrey. Yeah. Do you, do you, have you had a lot of opportunities coming in for your from for your players or for your clients rather um from the aspect of like trying to get a statement or you know how are they going to express themselves next season if there is a next season like you know how how has that been as far as navigating that because most if not all of your clients are minority male black men yes yes have you guys had any you know even if it wasn't professional have you guys had personal discussions about what's going on and and um, I guess how, how or if they want to speak up? Has that been hard? Yeah, so we have had personal discussions a lot. Um, Nate's been speaking out a lot on his Instagram. He actually got banned from Instagram now for doing... Um, wow. Brand he's not on there right brand. now? He's on Instagram, but he's banned from doing brand partnerships because of um, his, his outreach in... That's um, insane in social injustice yeah it's crazy so like I've, I've been seeing a lot of people that have been speaking out they'll get like shadow banned which is pretty much where you know if you type in somebody's name it doesn't really show up like somebody has to like add that person you have to click it 
um, yeah. their post their post up to you know they start to not show up as much the um, algorithm so you don't get exactly. the engagement that you would normally get Ex exactly yeah um so i've actually seen that with nate where we had i think it was body armor i was doing something with and i went to go um do it as a brand partnership and it only let me add the location it didn't let me add a brand partner so i was like oh that's weird maybe Maybe it's just like down. Maybe it's today. down. So then, or, yeah. yeah. So then I, yeah. <laughs> so then I switched over to my personal Instagram, and it was there, and I was like, "Huh, that's weird." So then I went to Nate's page and went into the actual settings, and it said that um, he didn't meet the community guidelines because of that, and it was literally because of that. Because right before that, I did one and it was fine. Um, and so I've been trying to reapply to get it, you know, reinstated and everything. But um, I know he's had a lot of like public outreach about it, as well as, you know, Larry Sanders. Um, we also stopped for a while of doing, you know, the brand partnerships just to not seem, you know, too insensitive with like, okay, cool, rest in peace, George Floyd. But buy these donuts from, you know, yeah. John's Bakery, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like we, 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 stopped doing a, a lot of the brand partnerships and then kind of assessed the companies that we were working with and you know where they stood um on the situation That's smart. um you know and figuring out like if there were if those were brands and, and um, companies that we wanted to continue our, our relationships with um and there were even a couple you know that we pulled back from and and kind of separated ourselves from just because of you know where, where their standings were um you know on, on the issues but I had always wondered that, I mean, because it's like, this is what's going on, but then people are still having to do business and you're having to kind of amp your business up to kind of mitigate the coronavirus um, exactly. loss that, you, that you've established. So it's kind of hard trying to figure out when it's okay to resume your normal activities. However, still speaking up because it's a movement, not a moment. Yep. So I, exactly. I would imagine that that would be one of the challenges when it comes to, you know, the marketing profession and having athletes that are speaking up that might not necessarily yep. have said anything when it happened to Mike Brown, but since then we keep getting all these hashtags and these are men exactly. and women that are black. So you're going to feel some type of way. Most of your clients have kids. Yeah. Some have black boys that are going to grow up to black men. So I, I could definitely see that being a cause that they would want to speak out on and then kind of having that caveat of, okay, well, this is going on with my people. The coronavirus is what's going on with the country. What's going on with my professional life and when can I resume? So thank you for shedding exactly. some, some light on that. Of and course. we're about to wrap it up. I know I've taken a lot of your time. Cool. You are super good. Good. Are you in LA now or, or Vegas? I'm in LA right now. I'm gonna go to Vegas after this for the for the five tournament. For the five tournament. So I will most yeah. likely see you there. But in the meantime, Perfect. please tell the listeners and viewers where they can find you on social media, if they want to follow in, you know kind of just see what you have going on, how you bounce back from this COVID and how you start to resume what as close to real or, or normal life as, as we can possibly get. For sure. Um, I, I would say Instagram's the easiest. That's what I update the most. Um, I've been trying to be more active on like LinkedIn and stuff like that. But Instagram right now for me, is definitely the most consistent. So at Polo Kerber, P-O-L-O-K-E-R-B-E-R. There, guys, you have it. Thank you so much for the, to the sports marketing guru, Polo Kerber. <laughs> Thank you all for listening and watching. Make sure you um, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Um, Instagram, Sheena underscore Marie, the number three, and quick out the blocks. Just quick out the blocks on Instagram. On Twitter, it is underscore Q-O-T-B underscore. And until next time, this has been Sheena Quick with Quick Out the Blocks. Everybody stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.